answer your rapid fire questions around resume writing, LinkedIn writing, you know, job search best practices. My, my background's in journalism. I've been writing resumes since the 20th century. I just never got paid for them until 2008. Um, so that's sort of where my background is, you know, coming from. Um, and I write for all sorts of job seekers, all ages. Um, but I get how hard it is. I'm here to just do whatever I can to help with that. And I'm going to ask everyone to put their uh, questions in the chat, um, and then we'll follow up from there. And anything we don't get to, um, we're definitely going to, you know, follow up after. Um, I was talking, you know, mentioned my new head, uh, uh, a headline or headshot on LinkedIn, and um, you know, I paid two hundred dollars for it, which was great. But I get that not everyone has that money in their budget, um, and so. What I did two pictures ago is I went to Home Depot and I stood in front of a white refrigerator or I kneeled in the refrigerator and I had my daughter take the picture and then she made it dazzling with her iPhone software. And, and that worked um, until I had the budget to do something different. So um, when you're in a pinch, there's a lot of good technology out there. Virginia, isn't that too expensive to buy a refrigerator to have a picture done? <laughs> I stuck it and did it for free. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I guess okay. a dishwasher would suffice too. But yeah, I just went literally went into the home improvement section and. So for those joining right now, if you can keep yourselves on mute, um, Virginia Franco is here. Um, this is gonna be a rapid fire thing. We're gonna do some Q and A of anything specific. Um, that's on your mind. Um, so as soon as you, we'll give it a couple more minutes, maybe 102, 103. And I know that seems a little weird, but it gives people a chance to go from one meeting to the other. So, and we are expecting a full house. Um, just as a reminder, we're gonna do this again a week from Wednesday. So if by some chance we don't get to your questions or if there's something that comes to mind after that, um, definitely um, you know, hold those. I'm loving Marie's iPhone uh, backdrop. Where is that? It's beautiful. It's just the backdrop. Um, it was at the Jersey Shore, but I'm sitting at my kitchen table. <laughs> oh, got it. I'll show you my, my favorite virtual background. Hold on. Okay. There we go. There we go. That's my oh, dream. Beautiful. Love now. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. There we go. Let me take it off now. Back to my boring room. Okay. Right. Yeah, actually, I don't. I didn't realize that it just went up. Um, so I guess that's one of the things I need to learn more about. <laughs> you, are you on your on the phone or are you on your laptop right now? On my phone. Oh, I don't know how to fix it on your phone. I'm sure you go into settings. Yeah. So if people want to start posting questions in the chat, I, I want to make best use of time. Um, as a reminder to those coming in late, we're going to be um having another session week from wednesday and if you can put your linkedin urls in the chat that would be great because we're keeping a networking spreadsheet so after the meetings we can all follow up with each other um, that's been something we talked about for a couple of weeks and we actually have it in place on google docs and we're definitely looking forward uh, to sharing it with as many people as possible and i know alex we're doing the whole thing with the networking groups here too in New jersey um, and I can answer questions on writing for humans, writing for the bots, um, writing to appeal to LinkedIn's algorithm and trying to, you know, also capture human beings and get them interested in your stuff. So. All right. So I'm monitoring the chat right now. So for anyone that, that wants to start asking the questions um, in the chat, um, if there's no questions, I'm happy to start the conversation, which I do a lot of the week weekly start. So I'll ask you this, what's the difference between the resume and a Oh gosh, there was a bunch of feedback I couldn't hear. It was sort of echoing. I don't know if someone's on mute. What's the difference between a LinkedIn profile and a resume? Oh, okay, very good. Um, so circa 2010, there was no difference. It was the cut and paste. Um, that has evolved because many more people are on the platform and uh, more people are on there for networking and for job search and for recruiting, all of it. I just, to me, resume is your piece of, uh, you know, hard copy marketing 
where the LinkedIn is your digital handshake. Um, it is the way, the place where the reader can hear your voice. So there's a big difference in the tone of the document. Uh, the resume is much more formal, where your LinkedIn is more conversational. Um, it's the place where you can comfortably talk about yourself in the first person, um, rather than um, if you have the same themes that you do in the resume, especially in the summary section or the about section now, but you have more room to build on it and tell the reader a little bit more about your particular story um, and how it aligns with what you want to target. Um, with your experience, um, there's things that you can sometimes include in the resume that maybe you don't want to share on LinkedIn, especially if you work for a private company or some of the information is proprietary. Um, but you can still sort of um, reference the figures that you're talking about. So if you, let's say you're in sales and you grew your revenue, you know, 30% to blah, 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 million, you can just say grew revenues, double digits. You know, you, could, you can use language that shows your accomplishments without getting you in trouble. Um, the other thing that's different about LinkedIn, um, well, people... People talk a lot about keywords and resumes. Uh, in my view, they are so much more important on LinkedIn because when you insert those keywords in the right places on LinkedIn, the algorithm will recognize it and it will, it'll help your, your profile to bubble up to the tops of more searches. Um, so there's, there's definitely strategic places and we can talk through all that, but strategic places where you should put the keywords that someone wants would be typing in to search for someone like you to put those into your profile. Does that answer that question? It does. Um, checking the chat here. Al, would you like to chime in? God, I'm really. <laughs> All you guys have to do is put this in the chat. If not, it's going to be a Q&A with Virginia and myself for the next <laughs> hour. Um, I am looking at some of the work that you all do. And I, um, hey, Shelly, um, I have experience working across these industries. So if you have industry specific questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, but I'm old. And so I have written for, you know, new grads to the most senior execs across all industries. Is the about section the most important part of LinkedIn? Um, so from an algorithm section perspective, I'm not sure it is. I feel like the, um, the headline at the very top is more important because that when you put, when you include terms in there that someone's going to use to search for talent like you, that is what, that's one of the bigger drivers of profile bubbles up. But then once your profile is amongst those that are on the top of a list, um, the about section is super important. Um, it is, so let me back up. I write LinkedIn profiles the same way I was trained to write for the news back when I was you know, first out of school. So because people read newspapers, magazines, all of that the same way they read our LinkedIn profiles. Um, and think about how you scan the news today. Um, you quickly scan a headline and if the headline grabs you, you'll read that first paragraph right after that. Um, it's journalism, they call the lead paragraph. I got it on. But those two sections tell you what the story is going to be about and what you want to come back to when you have more time. Um, LinkedIn's about section serves the same purpose as that lead paragraph in an article. Um, imagine a newspaper article that skipped the headline and skipped that about section and just jumped right into the story. You, number one, would probably be confused. And number two, you might skip it. Um, same thing goes for your LinkedIn. With the out the about section, some the reader is lost as to why you um, versus other people. Uh, what I recommend people do is always focus really a lot of attention on those first couple of lines when they um, the first two or three lines in that section because if the reader is hooked, then they're going to click to then read more. Um, so that's where you say this is why people bring me in. You know, it's, I fix hot messes. I do the startups. I um, help companies from cyber threats or so whatever it is. I feel like that that is the best way to sort of explain to the reader why you, um, that about section is more of a sort of a one-stop shopping place because you can tell them 
um, a bit about your career history. Some, if you have room, there's some might be some rooms for some career highlights. You can include your contact information in there um, as well. So um, it's sort of like that that one page. You know, when you're on vac uh, you're, when you go to like a vacation site, there's always like a little brief overview before you go into the little details about the um, about the location about section is. So how far back should the employment go um, on a LinkedIn profile? How far back the employment is? Um, so I know there's a couple of LinkedIn trainers on here. So I'm, I would love to hear if they feel differently. But for me, um, unlike a resume where I will focus heavily on the last 15 years um, and I'll just synopsize and remove dates from earlier experience with LinkedIn, if there is a really valuable job that that is super the narrative you're trying to tell, I tend to include it and I will, you know, I don't care if it happened in 1992. Um, what I like about LinkedIn is that if someone is continuing to click and they get all the way back to the, or those early days, you haven't lost them. So there's, there's no downside in including that information. But again, the caveat is that it needs to really add value to the story you're trying to tell and align. So if you scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins and you're targeting an IT job, there's a good chance there's a disconnect and you wouldn't want to include that on there. But um, let's say you work with a big, a really important company or you're a CIO and you want to show that you were a software developer in your early days. Having that in there shows that you, you know, have strong roots and strong chops in this earlier stuff. Um, and then the other thing you can do is you can allude to that earlier experience and that earlier background in your about section. So um, how would you know what keywords to use? Would you look at a job description and borrow from there? Um, yeah, so I, LinkedIn has really made it easy as of late. Some of their job postings literally have at the end a bunch of skills you know that they're the right ones because they have they're like with little in little bubbles with circles on them um, but if you if your job post you know I always ask to see a handful of job postings because that helps me to make sure that my documents are on target um, if the job postings you show don't have those little circled skills on it go to the bottom third of a job posting um, where it talks about sort of the required and then the nice to have qualifications. Um, that's where the gold is with the keywords. Is there a number of recommendations that you would suggest that people have? I think it's gone from three to five is, is what you really need for that, that whole star. But what would you think about as a best practice? So to me, it's the, the what they're saying versus the numbers a lot of times. Um, but yeah, three to five is a great starting point, but I would say make, depending on what you're targeting. So if you are targeting a leadership role, you want to have someone that is a old employee of yours talk about how great a leader you are. You might want to have someone that's above you talking about what a great job that you did with their team. Um, if you are, you know, so it, it depends on the role that you're targeting. What you want to do is have a handful of recommendations that speak to the qualities that are needed for the job that you're interested in. So just saying you're a nice, great person 42 times is, I guess it's nice, but it doesn't really say a whole lot about you and doesn't cement your brand any further. Now, um, when you change content on your profile versus keywords, I mean, what would impact the searches and views increasing over time? I mean, would it be um, putting content, would it be how the profile is written or is it just that the qualifications might not have matched um, what someone's looking for? How to increase that, are you talking about engagement on your views to your profile? Yes. yes. Um, so how my clients see an increase in views to their profile is um, through engagement, to be quite frank. So you don't need to be a social, but picking a couple of people that are sort of influencers or, or high shares in your industry or the companies that you're targeting, um, adding thoughtful comments to their posts, um, you know, five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night. Um, in, adding comments is a great way to sort of test the waters of being, getting engaged on LinkedIn, that if you're feeling more confident, you can 
maybe post some thoughts of your own and share an article of interest and tag a couple of people that you think can add value to the conversation. Um, that's a big way to drive traffic to your profile. Um, I actually, so last summer and this summer, I spent seven weeks where I did not post any original content, but I, every day I made a point of going on and I maybe added five or six comments to other people's posts. Um, I got last summer, it was 1200 new connections this, or 1200 new uh, followers and at least three to five quality connections every day. And this year I got double that. So, or this past summer. Um, so it, that engagement makes a huge difference. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they found me because I commented on someone's stuff. Should a, real, should a resume be tailored to the job or is it okay to use a standard resume? I kind of know the answer to that, but I'd figure. Um, so start with a, a master resume. To me, the experience is the experience. That doesn't change much. But what does change is how the branding at the top, um, you, you want to tweak it based on what you're targeting. So the, to me, the easiest places to make that tweak is you know, the headline at the top um, because the headline sets the stage for the reader. So as an example, let's say you are an IT executive. Um, if you add the word financial services IT executive, suddenly you are industry um, specific. And if you're applying for a role at Bank of America, that is gonna resonate more than if you just say financial service or IT executive. So that's an easy customization. Um, the skill section that I often include after the headline and after that summary, that's another place where you can add and subtract different skills that you are seeing in a job posting. Um, sometimes, I'm, I'm spacing on an example now, but sometimes it's the same skill, but they call it different things. So that's an easy tweak you can make. Um, the other place where you can make a modification is with the order of the bullets. The order of the um, um, when people are skimming these documents, after they look at the headline and the paragraph, um, they tend to jump down to where and when you work. And if they are looking at four or five bullets, they tend to, because they're in a rush, just look at the very first one. The other stuff doesn't get looked at often until later down the road. So you wanna make sure that the top bullet is most impactful. So think about the accomplishment that you wanna highlight based on that role that you're targeting. Well, since we have a lot of people here are, are of a certain age, as they say, how do you avoid or minimize the ages on, on both LinkedIn and resumes? Or is there a way to even do them? Besides obviously putting a picture out of LinkedIn, but what else would you suggest? Right, so on resumes, um, there's a couple things you could do to make yourself timeless. I've, I've always said it doesn't matter. Nobody needs to know if you're 35 or 85 on a resume. Um, but the other thing that happens with resumes that I don't think happens on LinkedIn in the same way is um, I, in the past, I've called it the rabbit hole phenomenon where we're reading stuff that right now it's like around before 2003, 2005, we enter into a rabbit hole and we say, oh gosh, I wonder how old that person is. I wonder how old their kids might be. Just all sorts of side nonsense enters our brains. And when you just have six, eight seconds to make an impression, I don't want three seconds spent in the rabbit hole. So how you minimize that while also making you timeless is that you have an earlier experience section and you include the roles that are valuable to the role that you're targeting. That doesn't mean you need to include every single role you've done pre-2003, but you can cherry pick the ones that are important and you synopsize um, what you did there. What, what are you most proud of there? Add a line to show that. And then you can remove the dates from it. <clears throat> um, if you want to make sure that applicant tracking software system can pick it up, but you don't want the human eye to pick it up, you can just put those dates in white font. Um, now with LinkedIn, you have to pick and choose those roles that are valuable, that are earlier. So, uh, you know, I talked about it before. I feel if, if there's a really important role that happened back when, I'm going to include it and throw the age discrimination concern out the window. Um, but if it's not valuable, don't include it, include it in the, in, with the goal of trying to make you timeless. Um, a really good LinkedIn picture will help, um, you know, I can't hide how old I am, but I can make myself look good for my age. Um, and then, you know, the language that you use, you wanna, you wanna position yourself as someone who is embracing, you know, the biggest bias that people 
that our Gen Xers and baby boomers face is that we are stinky at technology and that we think we're the smartest people in the room. And then the third one is that we um, don't love to learn because we think we know everything. So the ways that you can overcome that are by um, speaking about your collaboration. That's a great way to show that you're a team, team player. Um, with the technology you talk through, um, when a job requires certain kinds of technology proficiencies, you list those on there. If you, um, you know, sometimes in your interest section, um, especially on the resume, if you, um, you know, took a cool class or some, just something that's outside the box that shows that you are always trying to, to keep abreast of things, put that on there because that sort of cements the narrative. Um, with a lot of my clients, um, if they are presenting on topics they are considered sort of industry experts in certain fields, um, even if they didn't earn a dime doing it, I'll include that on there because it, it shows that they are keeping current and then people look to them for that. Just for people, on the meeting is being recorded, first of all. And then if we don't get to all the questions, we'll definitely be following up. Um, in terms of LinkedIn connection requests, is there a best suggested um, phrasing that you would do, especially if you want people want to do the one-on-one -on -one informational interviews? Is there a certain tac um, tactic? Language. Language-wise? So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the first thing I always make sure is to look at their activity and see if it seems like they're on LinkedIn. If they haven't even liked a post in seven years, they're probably never going to, they might not ever look at you on LinkedIn and you might not, they might not ever see you. Um, so in that case, I recommend you try to bypass LinkedIn as that first point of contact and um, get their email. Uh, I'm a huge fan of MailScoop for, as a great email tool. Because those people, some, you know, try to find some other way to reach out to them. Sometimes they might be on Twitter, but they're not on LinkedIn. So make sure that you look at that. But if they seem like they are somewhat active on LinkedIn, um, warm the relationship up. Um, you know, it's just like like a door-to-door -door salesperson. If you knew the person and they had been in conversations with you and then they knocked on your door to sell something, you'd be more apt to have that conversation. Um, the ways that you can sort of warm up the relationship are um, if they are active on the platform and they might post things and include a comment or two, um, send them an email, you know, they put on um, showing your appreciation, that sort of thing. And then when you approach them, they know that you're sort of invested in the relationship and this isn't just a one-off thing. Um, the other thing I recommend is to really search through their background, search through their company's history, look at, do you know, do some Google searching and see if there's some commonality or something that they've done that really piques your interest. You know, if they, um, I get this all the time where people um, really want to get into resume writing and they saw that my background was, you know, my, my background was in corporate communication. So I'll get people that say, I saw that you made that switch. How did you do it? Um, that's what I'm doing and that's what I'm in and that's what I want to get to. Um, so when someone has taken the time to learn a little bit about my background, um, I'm much more willing to jump in and give advice. Um, if they went to my alma mater, I'll, I'll talk to them pretty much no matter what. So try to find those sort of points of interest and common um, commonalities. So the other thing that comes up is a lot of people are taking training classes. Mm -hmm. there is, um, how far or how many certifications should go on a profile without it coming across like you're doing too much? Because some, some might be a week, a month, and some might be like the official ones like Microsoft, let's say. Um, so it depends on the jobs that you're targeting, right? If your job needs you to um, be social media savvy, for instance. Um, I get this for a lot, of, a lot of people that are in marketing and they did tried and true marketing, but they're sort of behind on the digital aspect. To me, it doesn't matter if you have seven certifications because that just shows that you're trying to learn it in depth. If you, um, so I, I think there's no one hard answer to it um, because it, it depends on the role that you're targeting. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. No, no. Everything, with, everything we do is it depends. There is no- so, Yeah, it depends. Um, so go to the postings. If nine postings say you have to know this, that, or the other, then you make sure that you, you know it and you do it. Um, 
if not, then that stuff doesn't resonate as much. So it doesn't mean you can't do it for your own interest, but. So the other question that came up is when, what date do you include in your last job if you were displaced but received severance, let's say for some time after that? Is it your last date on the job? Is it the last date you're being paid? So, so it depends because sometimes, sometimes severances, you get paid every two weeks and sometimes it's a big lump sum. Um, so it depends on the terms of your package. On the resume, I tend to include the last date that you got a paycheck. Um, with LinkedIn, um, I've, I've always felt like LinkedIn is the wild west for good or for bad. I see profiles where it's clear someone hasn't touched it in two years or solely out of date. I, I don't advise that, but if you if you lost your job and you're, you got a lump payment and it's been two or three months, I, I don't think you need to alert the, the universe that you're job ended just yet. I feel like there's a grace period there. Um, next question is, especially with everything going on politically, would you ever comment on something political or would you list facts or would you just not go there? So that, I mean, that look, that's a personal preference thing. The, the thing about speaking out on politics or religion, religion or is that it becomes a part of your brand. And brands by their very nature are designed to repel or attract. So if you are comfortable knowing that whatever you put out there will attract certain people and repelling others, then, you know, do whatever you want. But if you are trying to not offend any group, then it might be best to just sort of skip it. So, um, but it's, it's, it's really depends on someone's personal uh, preferences with that. Cause some people work with anyone who would, you know, disparage me because I voted for X, Y, Z person. So if that's you, then go comment away. If it's not, then maybe, you know, keep, keep your thoughts on that to yourself publicly on social media. So this is a resume question. When people have gaps, for whatever reason, or people coming to the workforce after many, many years, what are the best tactics that you would recommend? Because um, mm -hmm. maybe more normal now to be out of in transition yeah, okay. to account for the gaps over, over time. So if your gap is recent, you absolutely, and, and enough more than a couple months have gone by, you, you need to address it. Um, and I always recommend calling out, you know, you don't need to go into elaborate detail, but you can call out what you've been doing, why, why you left and what you've been doing. So if your job, if you were laid off because of COVID, let that person know. If you step back to take care of a alien family member, use that. But what you want to do is think about what skills you are using in that new role that you, you know, the, the role that you're not getting paid for um, that can align with what you want to do next. So for instance, I had a client who had to take two and a half years off because of an one and then a second alien parent. He just got double. Um, he wanted to get back into IT program management. So we talked about how um, he had to meet with doctors and nurses and you know, skilled care facilities, all of the stakeholders. We, we talked about his role caretaking as a project management role and just spoke to that. Um, now, if your role, if your gap was before that, um, if it's a short gap, there is an, sort of an easy camouflage. You can, um, rather than listing your employment as months and years, you can just use the years and that will you know, that way if there's a nine month gap or even an 18 month gap, sometimes it doesn't show as much because you've just focused on the years. Um, but the other thing I always say is reflect back on again, what you've done during that time. I have rarely come across people that aren't doing something during that time, whether they are volunteering or lending their skills for free to someone um, to, and include that. So for me, um, when I you know, I have four kids when they were little and I was drowning in diapers, I did not get paid to work 40 hours a week. So, but I was always writing for school newsletters and, you know, whenever there was a fundraiser, I did all of the, the writing for it. Um, and so I just sort of lumped together my experience as a freelance writing um, conglomeration. And, you know, nobody needed to know if I did it for 30 hours a week or 30 hours every six months. Um, it showed that I kept my skills current um, and that was what was the most important. The other question a lot of us get here is how long should your resume be? One page, two pages, three pages. I'm sure you've gotten this question before. It depends, right? 
No, um, I know, but yeah. I mean, one talk, from your perspective as a resume writer, it's a little different than us talking amongst ourselves. So if you have less than five years of experience or you're right out of school, um, nine times out of 10, it's going to be a one pager. After that, it's, I really try to keep it to two pages. There have been occasions where I've gone to three pages and usually that third page is where I might include an addendum where I might have some publications or, you know, some other stuff. The problem with much longer resumes is that not all people, but lots of readers are sort of ADD about this stuff. And if they see a bunch of pages that they have to go through, my concern is that because I know they're in a rush, they might skip it. And there seems to be a tolerance for a two-page resume in a way that there isn't always for a three-pager. Um, there was something, I was going to make another point and now I forgot what it was. Um, oh, I have seen studies, like if I, I cannot remember where I saw it, but it was that most recruiters prefer a one-page resume. And um, I remember when it came out, everyone was freaking out that they had to get to one page. But when they then looked at the percentage of recruiters, what, how long the resumes were of the people they hired, the vast majority were two-page resumes. So in their head, they thought they wanted a one-page, but in reality, they were looking at, they were hiring two-pagers. So that's sort of the gold standard I aim for, understanding that there will be deviations or exceptions with certain clients. That's a good question. Um, no, I mean, I think from a resume writing perspective, it's different than we talk amongst ourselves because um, we all have different ways of going about things. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think there's certain ways that we can tell that we're of a certain age. I know some people still put um, their addresses on the resume. Some people have the weird, the old email addresses. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are like the main, when someone comes to you for a resume, review or writing, what are the first things that you would be working with them on? So in terms of just that um, formatting to make you look super current, city, state, and zip works. You don't need the full address. A lot of people don't recommend a full address anymore because of security concerns. Um, have an email that's not cringy or that doesn't show your date of birth. Um, I always say just set up a, a Gmail for purposes of the job search. Um, you can also, if you don't want to put your home number on there or your voicemail often gets full and you're bad about checking it, just set up a Google voice number and put that on there and then forward it to yourself. So those, um, the other thing I always recommend someone do is uh, the people do is have your LinkedIn URL listed on there because that shows that you are current on technology that you're using the platform. Um, when I am working with people, what I do is ask them what their job target is, because that's. That's the basis of everything. When someone isn't super clear on their target, it means I can't write a, a well, I can't write a targeted resume. Um, and if someone can't figure out from the, at the very beginning, the kinds of roles that, that the person's targeting, then you've lost the reader. So number one is ask for the job target. Number two is I want to see some job postings of interest so that I can make sure that the, um, I've got the right keywording, the right key phrasing. And Usually people will send, you know, I get a sense for the kinds of companies that interest them based on what they're sending me. There's always a, you know, a certain vibe with certain companies. So, you know, I, the way I might write for Silicon Valley is going to be how I write for Wall Street. So that is important to consider. Um, and then when I'm talking, th th when I'm talking with someone, I, I spend 90 minutes with them, walking them through their career from beginning to end. But what I want to understand and what I encourage people when they're writing their own resumes to do is reflect back on the role and think about what, what were you brought to do? What, why were you recruited in? What was the problem or the challenge that you were facing when you came in? And how do I know that I did it and did a good job? Um, those answers are what is going to, and what your bullets are going to be about. Um, you're gonna make sure to include the things that you are proudest of. Um, spell out those achievements or those accomplishments. What you're doing is you're showing results, but you're weaving in the day in and day out responsibilities. And that is my, that just has a laundry list of, here's responsibility A through X. Um, that doesn't, people don't remember that stuff. They remember what you did and how you did it. Um, and when companies see 
results, they say, well, that's what I need. I need someone who can do that. And um, it really does increase the amount of calls that my clients get. How do you feel about cover letters? Um, I mean, I love cover letters. The problem is, is that um, they get, in my experience, they get tossed out anywhere from like half to a third of all the, you know, all reads. They don't even get read, they get tossed. Um, but when they do get read, they can make a really big difference. So there's sort of no downside in using it, but if, but just know that it might not always be read. Um, if you are applying online and the job posting calls for cover letter though, you better have one. Um, and just so you know, a lot, every opinion that I'm stating, I, these are not my own opinions. They are all, well, they are my opinions, but they are not stuff that I made up. I, every decision I make for my clients is grounded in information that I get from people that uh, study the ins and outs of LinkedIn in recruiting across industries that are in HR. Um, so like the cover letter thing, some recruiters read them, some don't. But I have been a part of enough Twitter surveys to do the math and say, okay, there, it's clear that half are not getting read. Um, so that's where my, how I'm basing my answers. Would you, when people apply to jobs, should the job posting match what the title is on the resume? Is that going to be like a necessary thing or can it be a little more general? I'm changing the headline on your resume or the title is the easiest way to, to customize it for that reader. So yeah, do it. Now, I know we have Lynn Williams on the call who's very into the ATSs. So um, they're a necessary evil for sure. Um, are there any suggestions from a, that as a resume writer, are there any suggestions that you might give toward getting a better shot at coming through an ATS? Uh, so just from a job search perspective, I've always felt that you want to do whatever you can to bypass you having ATS be the first point of entry in a position. Um, and that's, you know, I'm sure you've talked before about the hidden job market, but I always think back to human nature and in my experience, it's human nature when a, when a person has a, a job that they're hiring for while they've got HR on the phone and they're working with the person on creating the job posting, they're also talking to people they know and thinking, well, who do I know? Hey guys, who do you know? So what has happened is that by the time the postings come out, there might very well be a good pipeline of people that are sort of pre-qualified for the role. Um, my husband last year, when he was looking just through conversation. Every time he talked to someone, he got three other names and he was just having a ton of conversations. He got two calls within a matter of months where they said, okay, the posting's going up in the next week, be on the lookout for it. And so then once the posting came out, it didn't number, matter if he was number two or number 200 to go through because there was someone looking for it on the other end. Um, that being said, there are a couple of things you want to do because you want to make sure that your resume gets all the credit it deserves on through ATS. You know, ATS doesn't necessarily boot your resume out. A lot of people sort of use that terminology, but what it does is it doesn't always read everything correctly. Um, you know, there's what, 293 different applicant tracking software systems. Um, some are more advanced than others. So you sort of have to make generalities um, or I write to the, I try to write for the lowest, the least mature advanced ATSs that are out there. Um, when I'm, when you have to submit your resume in Microsoft Word, I make sure that there's nothing important in a header or a footer. Um, so the, when people submit Word and their contact info's in the header, you know, that's, ATS can't read it. So you, you miss the opportunity for them to be able to, to see that. Um, if you, you, you know, sometimes with those Microsoft Word templates, the, the resume templates, they require you to enter information into those little boxes. LinkedIn can't read anything inside a box. So text boxes, um, charts, graphs, none of that, I can't read it. Um, but when you submit it as a PDF, a lot of those concerns don't apply um, because of how the technology is reading it. So I guess what I'm saying is make sure to try to use, a, uh, try to use PDF when you can. Um, the other thing that happens, and this is with the less mature ATS systems, is that if you have, let's say you've worked for the same company, you've had three different titles. If the system doesn't see the company name next to each and every job title, 
it won't, it might not give you credit for all the years that you were in those roles. It, what it does is it only, it only might, might only read the most recent job and company name. Um, so you're missing, you, so if, a, if the ATS is programmed so that the person, the candidate needs to have 10 years of experience and seven of those years were in those earlier roles, you might lose credit for that. Um, so with PDF again, or sorry, more, the more advanced systems, you don't have to worry about that as much, but the older ones you do. And so what I do is I, um, I will include the company name next to the job title, but I will change the font so no one can see it. Cause that it's disruptive for the human being to read it, but for the bot, it works great. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah. I mean, cause I know that, uh, there's a question about whether it should be a PDF or should be a doc when it's submitted. Awesome. What? Some systems don't take word. Um, so if they don't, then you've got to use it. Um, but more of them are more advanced now that if they say do PDF, I'm okay with PDF. I didn't used to be, but I am now. So should a resume or even a LinkedIn profile, is there a certain tense it should be in first person versus third person um, in terms of, I mean, I, I feel it's for the person, for the job, for the person, the hiring manager, it's, that's that it should be in that, in, in that uh, voice. What do you think? So with LinkedIn, it's absolutely, it's conversational, use the word I. Um, with resumes, that, that, that's a little too casual for certain industries. You know, I wouldn't use the word I left and right if I was writing a Wall Street resume, for instance. Um, so write it as if you're saying the word I, but you remove that, you don't say me or you don't say I um, in the link. Resume, right? Sorry, and, yeah, and resumes. Resumes sort of shorthand that way. You you remove a lot of that. Um, remove I. You remove a lot of. Um, there's other little words that you remove from resumes that your English teacher would have a heart attack about. So words like a or an or the. Um, you don't need those. What about um, job scan as a tool? Is is that a good tool to kind of go through to see, um, you know, do a keyword search and comparison? Um, is John Shields on the call? Uh, see on there from jobs is John Shields from on the call from job scan um, uh, so, um, on the call um, so I think job scan is a great tool for if you if you're struggling to make sure that the keywords that you have on your resume and with the job postings I think job scan is a great tool um, a couple years ago I got the chance to speak with them at a conference and I said, you know, they, they recommended, I don't know, it was like a certain percentage that you needed to, to hit before it would go through. I was like, my clients are getting jobs with half of that. Um, and so I always say, don't get super hung up on the scores, um, but just look at those keywords that you're missing and work to insert them in. But I think it, it's a great tool for if you're struggling for that. How do you feel about keyword stuff when you get a resume into the ATS? Great for bots, but when the human reads it, they're going to kick you out. So you lost your... You've lost your audience. Okay. Um, I'm just looking here through the chat as we're speaking. Anyone, does anyone have anything? I mean, I'm tempted. If you want to open the mics, we'll give it a shot. Someone said, should you submit a text resume? Yeah. Um, so back in, back like pre-recession, yeah, I used to do a plain text version. Um, the, the software has advanced beyond that. So you really don't need that. Um, but if you are ever concerned that what you put in a Word document can't be read, convert it to, the, to plain text just for your own eyes to make sure that it's getting every, that, that everything that you put in there is showing up. That's how you can tell if stuff is, stuff can't be read. But you don't need to submit a plain text version anymore. Those were pain to do. Anyone want to ask a question? Give it a shot wrote, can you use word art to find keywords? Um, are you talking about like those, uh, the word bubbles where you? Yeah, um, can Canva and stuff like that, Canva. Yeah. Um, I mean, some people say they use them, that they're great at those. Um, I'd rather just look at the job postings and use a, old, a highlighter, to be honest, but people say they work well. Um, there is a function called Microsoft Word Art, which I do like to use for um, sometimes, I'm not a fan of design for design's sake, but sometimes I'll use Microsoft Word art if I feel like 
adding a small design element will tell a story a little bit better. But what happens when you do that is that it then reads it as a graphic. And so you have to make sure to sort of hide those words somewhere else so that they can see them. Are there any specific fonts or types of type typefaces you'd suggest in a resume or some to stay away yeah, from? Yeah, so uh, sans serif fonts are what I go for. Sans serif are the ones without the little tails on the end um, because they are an easier online read. Um, right now, resumes do get printed out, but they don't get tend to get printed out until sort of later down the road, um, third or fourth round reads. So you need to make sure that whatever you write is just as easy to read on an iPhone or a laptop as it is in print. Um, so sans serif works great. Um, I would stay away from the Google fonts just because um, they're not standard. And my understanding is that and if someone knows differently, that's more of an ATS guru than I, um, sometimes they don't they're not recognized as well. And, and I don't know what they will convert it to. So um, the Microsoft Word standard ones though are pretty well accepted. Lynn? Lynn? Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Williams, calling ATS expert. All right. All right, well, if you think differently, let me know. Yeah. So what, what, what do you consider the most important content in a cover letter? We talked about how important they are, but what would you consider putting yeah. in? So, um, there's a couple different formats I use, but the main content you want to include is a paragraph that says, this is why people want to work. This is why I am hired for roles time and time again. Then I will have a, I, I always try to include two or three highlights that back up that what I'm saying I can do, I can do. Um, and then in my closing paragraph, I will add some information that makes me unique, maybe some, some aspects that are uh, that a traditional candidate might not have. Um, and then, you know, I always, I always close out and say, you know, looking forward to chatting. Um, so that's sort of my traditional document. However, if you're using this, if you're trying to make a career change um, or there's a, a pressing issue that you need to address, like a job gap, or you're looking to move, or whatever it is, then that uh, the cover letter is a great place to make it happen. Um, so, with a career change uh, cover letter, I will again show that first paragraph the the transferable skills that have made you so successful in this role that are equally applicable in the next role, and speak to that. Um, three highlights that show why, how you succeeded in those transferable roles. Um, and then your last paragraph might cement why moving to this industry means so much to you. Um, and it sort of addresses the elephant in the room. So I was working, it's been a couple months, but an IT executive who he really wanted to go and work for universities. He felt like he'd made a bunch of money and he wanted to help students and so we talked about that he was in a position now where he could give back and, you know, he credited his education to getting him where he was today and he wanted to, you know, sort of come full circle. So that was part of the messaging. Um, so as always, it depends, but think about, think about what you want to make sure is important to convey, especially if there's anything that would maybe make someone scratch their head at looking at your resume. Um, the, the cover letter is a great place to expand upon that and call it out. Should we be concerned about casting our net out to too many postings? I've been concerned about applying for several positions at once in case I'm accepted at one. I want to have, I want to have more than one offer. I mean, so I, I don't have a ton of faith in the job boards. You need to apply to a hundred jobs to get three responses. Um, so I don't know if there is concern of too many, um, I always recommend sort of, you know, rethinking the job search strategy rather than spending 90% of your time looking at postings, spend just 10% of your time with that and instead sort of re-engineer the process and think about, okay, who, what are companies that are interest me where I live? Who do I know at those companies? Who do I need to know at those companies and how can I connect, the, you know, close that gap, whether it's someone who knows someone who knows someone or, you know, outreaching through, um, through the, the, the warm emails and, and LinkedIn uh, messaging. 
Um, but that, that process, it doesn't feel as productive, but it is, it's like a fast pass to Disney world. Um, I've used that analogy. It really does catapult you and it makes your job search much, much shorter um, because of the problems behind applying online in that there's, a, you know, often a pipeline of qualified people already in place for the job posting, et cetera. Um, in my experience, the best spot at having luck with applying online though, as your first point of entry is to do it within the first day or two. I think networking is so important that we try to, we talk about this all the time here. It's not, it, it, it's more important to have these follow-up sessions, have the cup of coffee, because it's not just getting to know each other, but knowing who they know too. It, and that's, that's one of the things I always like. So many of the people on these calls have met with me and with other people. And I think it's so important, especially now you have an opportunity to meet so many people you never normally would be able to. I mean, A hundred percent. Um, you know, my, and it doesn't matter how old you are with this. I don't know if we have any young people on here, but, um, you know, my son is a senior in, in college right now and he, you know, he didn't, he wouldn't listen to me with the whole applying online thing. It was quite maddening last year, but he finally got with the program in the spring before um, he got with the program in time. And I said, look, look at my LinkedIn profile connections. Look at your fathers, look at people we know that, you know, from coaches and see if there's people you want to connect with, you know, the kind of roles you want to be into. Um, and he started making you know, he gave me a list and said, these are people I'd love to talk to. So I did send an email and said, this is my kid. I don't know if he's talented or not, but if there's any wisdom you can impart, great. Um, not all responded to me, but a lot did. And he started having those conversations. Every time he got off the phone, he asked for a couple other names of people to talk with. Um, and those conversations led to two amazing internships. And he's got a job offer well before um, he got an offer in September of this year. Um, it, and meanwhile, so he was doing that while he was also applying online. He really didn't have much luck applying online. So what's your strategy like for a follow-up after an interview or even from the sense of you send a resume? I mean, maybe not so much for the job board. Is there a time frame or a suggest a way to, to, to or after, for reaching out after you've had the interview? Or even after you, one after the interview, but also separately, maybe after I've sent the resume. I mean, how much time should I allow? I mean, there's two different parts to that, I guess. So now because of COVID, things are just, they're slower. They're much more frustrating for job seekers. Um, I feel like decision makers are, they're more anxious. It reminds me of back in 2008, where they're just saying, let, let, this per let, the, let me talk to one more person before I make a decision, or let's have one more round of interviews beforehand. Um, so right now I'm saying every five to seven days, reach out and what you, what the core of that messaging needs to say is, you know, thank you for our initial point of contact. Um, the second point needs to be, I know that this is a nutty nut um, and that you have lots of other competing priorities. Um, if you need anything else from me, let me know. Um, and then close out by always sort of expressing your interest again, saying how excited you would still be to be part of that to have an opportunity to have continued discussions and be a part of that team. Um, but so touching base every, you know, every five to seven days, I feel like is the sort of that good balance between feeling like a stalker and, and showing interest. Um, a lot of people don't want, you know, you don't want to feel like you're desperate, um, but you also want to, you also want to be persistent. So. And there's different strategies. I mean, one of the things I always do is I, I, I always, when I'm posting or commenting on something, I always follow up with people, um, that commented and liked because we have that first point of contact. I mean, that's, I think how I met Christine. I think, I'm not sure exactly how you and I met, but most of the people from New Jersey, I kind of know from going to the different events, but it's so important to build relationships outside of that, that comfort zone that we, we all live in. A hundred percent. And when I see, they don't have to have commented on mine, but if they made a thoughtful comment on something that I posted, I'll, I'll make that connection. Um, it's led to meeting, you know, like you and I did meet on LinkedIn and same with Alex and I, um, it's the best way to build a network. Um, and, and you should, you, you need a network, um, job search and, and for career advancement. This is not something you can go at alone. It's, it's a really tough process. Um, and you need to have a whole bevy of different kinds of people in your group to, to help you get through it. 
And, and I always, and I started to realize, because I'm an introvert, as everyone knows really well, I was afraid to reach out to people. I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid of um, not being able to put myself out there. And it, it, you can be your own worst enemy. Yeah, you can. No, absolutely. Um, uh, to me, there's there's no downside in reaching out because they ghost you. They ghost you online. It's not like you're stood up at a restaurant waiting for them. Um, but I've, I mean, I've cold called pitched back when I was first starting and I wanted to um, start getting in and getting my uh, name in publications. I would pitch the editors on LinkedIn and you know, a lot did blow me off, but all I needed was one or two who wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt like there was no downside with the outreach. Well, that was the thing with Jack Kelly. Jack Kelly and I, we met at the breakfast club here in New Jersey yeah, that. Uh, on a Sunday morning, we were just there and Alex was there and we started talking and one thing led to another. And this is, you know, you're in Forbes, I'm in Forbes, but Jack's a great guy. I mean, he's not like this insurmountable person. Yeah. And he knows a lot and he knows a lot of people. And he's a great, great person to have in your, in your corner. And everyone on this call is really great in different ways. I mean, I think you all sell yourselves short at times. Um, you know, one of the things I would say in job search is, you haven't lost your abilities. You may not have a specific job now, but you're, you're still as good as you were before. And maybe you've taken a hit um, with your, you know, socially and personally, but it doesn't change who you are. And mindset is so important. It's more than what we do for a living. Alex, would you like to get the last word in? Because um, you're here on the call and you always, always like to follow up with questions. I like to give people a chance to talk. Um, and usually if they don't do it right back, it's because you're doing multi- multitasking, which brings me to a question. Is multitasking, because someone posted about this today, is multitasking another way of procrastinating? Because you're doing a multi- multiple sure. things at one time, but you're not finishing anything. It's just a question. Uh, for me, yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm the worst. My email box is always empty because I can't stand doing the same thing for more than nine minutes before I have to jump on. Um, to look at something else. Um, so I, when I'm multitasking, I just try to make sure that whatever I'm segueing to, it's something productive. But when I really, really need to get into non-procrastination mode, I put white noise on my um, headset and I just, <laughs> I turn my notifications off on my all of my socials. So what types of people would be in your LinkedIn network? Should it be everyone, people you know, people in an industry or people you don't know? I mean, that's um, what are your thoughts? Um, it needs to be a, it needs to be diverse for sure. So, um, I would start with your sort of first string players. So your family and friends and, um, colleagues, old bosses, all of that. Then from there, you need to think through, um, again, the companies that you might be interested in working in the industries you're interested in working in. And you can use LinkedIn's filters to who, who are people that maybe would be your peers in those roles? Um, and then the one level up of what you're targeting, the people that would be in the room making those hiring decisions and start trying to get those people in. Um, I do think it's a good idea to have recruiters in your network. Um, and then people like Kenneth or Alex or myself or Lynn or that, you know, our networks are really big. So if you comment on something, there's a chance someone else is going to see it. Um, because we, we have a ton of connections. So I guess a good mix is my answer to that. And one of the things I always say is when someone actually um, reaches out to me and I, um, and I say, how can I help you? I'm not being general. I'd love to know specifically what I can do. Yeah, same. I mean, most people, it's a very generic term, but if you can be specific, it helps all of us. It helps me and it helps anyone else who's gonna get that follow-up. Yeah, and it, what is so powerful is when you're really, really clear on the role that you want and how you're a good fit for it. Um, because then when someone is gets a chance to, to advocate for you or champion your name, speak to that directly versus, well, you want a job and you're open and, um, you know, it's like trying to help someone find, recommend a house that they want to buy. If you just say, oh, I'll take any house, any square footage in any area, that doesn't help you to pinpoint exactly where they should, where you can help them find it. And it's also about recommendations. Think about, as you said, if you're on your house, you're going to get recommendations for work because you trust the people. I would, everyone here, I would say, can be trusted. I mean, we may not have all the answers, but we certainly can point people in the right direction. 
Yeah. And there's not always a right direction. There might be multiple. So if everyone can give some, some, you know, way in. All right. So what I'm going to do, since it doesn't seem like we have any other questions, um, Virginia and I are going to do this again a week from Wednesday at three to four. If in the meantime, if anyone has any questions that they want to follow up, um, Virginia, I don't know if you want to, you know, make mention of what you're doing um, in terms of if you, if people can reach out to you or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so I have sort of two things that I can point people to. Um, I have my own company, Virginia Franco Resumes. I, I couldn't think of a good company name, so I just <laughs> stuck my own name on it back when. Um, but I'm because of COVID, I've been booked out quite a bit, so I am not in a position to help people that are urgently job seeking. Um, but I definitely can give you names of people that have shorter waiting lists. Um, and then the other thing that I um, uh, that I am part of is called Job Search Secret Weapon, and I formed it with three other women. Um, we were at a conference a year and a half ago and just frustrated with the fact that we work one-on-one -on -one with people and there were so many other people that would want to work with someone one-on-one -on -one and couldn't, or they just, you know, they didn't have the funds for that sort of thing. So Job Search Secret Weapon is sort of our child, our labor of love, and it is a DIY job search support um, system. And what we've done is created sort of these micro pocket products to help you based on what, what unique thing you need for your job search. So if you need help with answering that, tell me about yourself question, we've got a little a guide and a video to help you with that. If you need some samples of some really good resume bullets, we've gone through our own work and organized them by sector and industry for you. Um, uh, I mean, you name it, we've got a product for it. So um, go to there, the products start, they're from like $4 to $9. We really wanted to try to offer something that doesn't break the bank. Um, so if you feel like you're a decent writer and you're just struggling or, or you, you're just a little rusty with things, but your fundamentals are good, it might be a good oper a solution for you. Oh, thanks a lot, Virginia. We will thank you so much. We'll see you next week. And, and thank you personally for the ability to be on your podcast. I got to tell you, that was an amazing Alex, opportunity. And Alex is a guest of mine as well. So you guys, yeah. you know your stuff. I, I focus on writing, but you guys have an area of expertise that I don't. And so I'm so happy that you can share it with, with my listeners. So Definitely. And we, we'd love to have you here. This is a great group. Um, thanks again. We'll see you next week. Guys. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Virginia and Ken. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.